Well, good morning there, Valley Bible Church. It's so good to see you. Glad that you are here with us on our online platform. We're in a great time journeying through the Gospel of John. We are about to close out the first chapter of the Gospel of John. And what we have found is that the scriptures that were written almost 2,000 years ago have been incredibly relevant to what's going on right now. Speaking directly to the situation that we are currently experiencing in our nation and around the globe. We found the scriptures to be incredibly relevant to the racial tension that we're feeling right now. Uh, let me just go back a couple weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, we, we, we asked the question, who? Who is going to bring the world that ought to be? Who is going to bring the world that should be? We, we also got a little deeper there, a little, little uh, uh, more intimate. We said, who is going to uh, make us who we ought to be? Who is going to make us who we should be. We, we kind of were aware and just admitted just right out front saying, hey, things are not as they should be. Things need to change. And, and we, we need to change. So who can we look to? Well, the scriptures made it very clear. Jesus Christ is the only one who can make our moral dreams a reality. He's the only one we can look to, to, to make us better and to make the world better. We need a movement of seeing Jesus better. Because when we see him as we should, we will see each other as we should, and we will treat each other as we should. So, so last week, we, we asked ourselves, well, how can we start this movement? How can we create this movement? How can we kind of change the landscape of what's going on right now? How can we change this idea of, uh, of seeing another skin tone as not being worthy of the same value as our own? And we dug down deep and said, this whole problem is a sin problem. Because it's a sin problem that looks at skin and calls it a problem. And Jesus Christ is the only one who's going to change our view. So how do we start this movement? We said it's actually very simple. It's right there in front of all of us. If we would have a conversation, we could start a movement. If we just start talking to people about Jesus and showing them who he is to us, and if they embrace who he is, they're going to see the world different. So today I want to unpack, well, what's the biggest hurdle to that kind of movement starting with a conversation? Yeah, just think for yourself, just, just privately in your own mind, in your own experience. I, I know you want to tell people about Jesus. I know you want to share your faith, and I'm sure that you have before. But what's the biggest fear that kind of overcomes you? What, 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 what stops you kind of in your tracks, emotionally overwhelms you, and stops you from having a conversation about Jesus. I'll tell you personally from my own experience. From my own experience, I think the biggest hurdle for me and for many that I know is the fear of not knowing, not knowing enough information, feeling like you're going to get a question that you won't know the answer to. And the big thing that we fear is saying the words, I don't know. Well, if that's you, if that connects with you, you have ever felt that fear of not knowing enough to share your faith, let me tell you right now, you are in good company because we all feel like that. And Jesus' first century followers felt like that. In fact, one of Jesus' closest first century followers, one of his disciples, one of his apostles, often found himself in a position where he did not know the answer. He didn't know enough. But what's great about this guy, a guy we could all identify with, is that he had a perfect strategy to overcome that. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. We're going to be introduced into uh, the character of this disciple. And then we're also going to talk about the strategy that he used to overcome kind of his fear of not knowing the answer. So journey with me. Let's go to John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 43. John chapter 1, verse 43. And the character group we're going to be introduced to is a disciple by the name of Philip. Philip. And here's what we're going to see is Philip's strategy, if I could summarize it, which is the big idea for this morning. So if you want to take down uh, maybe a note on your phone or maybe you have a piece of paper next to you and you got a pencil, you can write this down. This is the one thing I want you to remember from this Sunday. If you're going to remember one thing, I want you to remember this. This is a kind of a summary of Philip's strategy. And the big idea is this. Introductions are better than answers. Introductions are better than answers. Answers are good. 
we should look into answers. We should read about answers. We should be prepared with answers when people ask us questions. We should try to seek out answers to our own questions. Answers are a good thing. I'm not saying that they're bad. But I think what's more powerful is an introduction. An introduction to an encounter with Jesus. I think what you'll find is that is way more persuasive than an answer. Let me show you how Philip used this strategy as the kind of I don't know a disciple, the I don't know follower of Jesus, the guy who never seemed to know the answer to many of the situations he found himself in. So let's just jump into our introduction with Philip. This is John chapter 1, starting with verse 43. It says, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. We looked at them before. Andrew is the one who had an encounter with Jesus, was so just amazed at who Jesus was, decided, I got to bring my brother. I got to tell my family member. I got to tell my brother, my my kinsman. I got to tell him about Jesus. And so he brings Peter, who at the time was called Simon. He brings him to Jesus. and And then Peter starts following. Simon starts following. And this is when Jesus renames Simon to Peter. Well, this is the same thing that Philip's going to do. Philip has this encounter. Jesus says, follow me. And he has this encounter with Jesus. He's so incredibly blown away at who Jesus is, he has to go tell his friend. Not his family member, not like uh, we had with Andrew. We saw that last week. But he has to go tell his friend. Now, we could just stop here and see that this is the true power of Christian impact. That really, we don't need professional preachers to share the message of Jesus Christ. In fact, the most effective person to share Jesus Christ is a friend or family member. That the gospel is best received not from a professional, but from a friend or family member. And we see it right here at the start of Jesus' ministry as he's gathering his disciples. Yes, he goes and he finds some of them, but some of them recruit others. And right here we have Philip recruiting a man by the name of Nathaniel. But let's just look at what Philip says about Jesus. Let's jump back. We're in verse 45. It said, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now what's happening here? What he says is, hey, Nathaniel, we we found the guy we've been looking for, the guy we've been waiting for. You see, see for us in the 21st century world, we don't really understand the kind of uh, the eager landscape that that the New Testament was written in and that these disciples are, are in. There's an eagerness to the Jewish people. They're looking for someone. They're looking for a great leader. They're looking for a hero. And there's all these Old Testament passages that speak about this great hero who's going to come. And and many different images are given of this hero. He's called Messiah or or anointed one. He's called the Christ, the, the special one that God sets aside. That's what that idea of anointing means and the idea of being the Christ, and he's, he's talked about as being a king. He's, he's talking about, uh, about as being God's son. All of these different imageries are brought up that, that there is going to be a hero, a hero that would come. And so what Philip is saying to Nathaniel is, finally, man, he's here. You see, the last prophecy written about this Messiah, this great hero, is hundreds of years old before we get to this time. So they've been waiting for a very long time. We can go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis and see that really Messiah was promised right after the first sin occurred. So we could be saying more than just hundreds of years, but thousands of years the people of God have been waiting for this hero. And Philip has such a dynamic encounter with Jesus. He is convinced, Nathaniel, I found him. I found him. He says, and he speaks to kind of one of those ideas of what this Old Testament hero is. He says, I found the one, in verse 45, whom Moses in the law was talking about. Now, who's that? Now, Moses is an incredible leader for the Jewish people. He's the one that delivered them out of slavery in Egypt and brought them to the edge of the promised land. 
And in the book of Deuteronomy, which is one of my favorite books in the Old Testament, Moses is preparing the people to enter into the promised land, this land they've been waiting for for a very long time. And in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, God makes a promise to Moses. He says, you know, Moses, you're great. You've led the people, but I'm going to raise up another like you, a prophet like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to my people. Well, ever since that day, that moment, the people of God have been waiting. And, and there's many, a much evidence in the New Testament that shows that this anticipation of we're waiting for a greater Moses, another Moses, somebody who could command God's people with such power and such dynamic leadership that, that he could free them just like Moses freed them from Egyptian slavery. Maybe the Messiah, this hero, this new Moses could free them from Uh, the Roman reign that was over them right now. Philip is convinced this is the guy. This is the one that Moses talked about. Uh, But he says even more than that. He says, whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Now, what is he saying here? This is kind of a a broad reference. He says the prophets. I mean, this just spans uh, many authors and many voices. So now he's just taking all of the Old Testament hope and saying, I have found the one we've been waiting for. Man, Philip is convinced. So he feels like with confidence, he could come to his friend Nathaniel. I've got the information I need that has convinced me that Jesus is the Messiah. So I'm going to deliver this to my friend, my friend Nathaniel. And here's what you find. That Philip may have enough information, but Nathaniel is not. He's not going to have enough information. In fact, he is going to ask a question. He is going to be confused by the information that Philip presents. And what Philip is going to do, he's going to find himself kind of, well, in an awkward position. Because he knows enough to be convinced, but he doesn't know enough yet to convince his friend. So what is he going to do? Let's look at Nathaniel's kind of reaction to Philip's reaction about Jesus. Look at verse verse 46. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's an odd question. This may not ever be a question you get when you're sharing your faith, but it is a significant question. Now, at first glance, when we first read it, it almost sounds like maybe Nathanael's being a little prejudiced, right? He's kind of profiling, if you will. What, what, what do you mean, Jesus of Nazareth? Does anything good come out of Nazareth? You can kind of feel the disdain, right? The, the bad taste in, in, in Nathaniel's mouth when he just even says the term Nazareth. Now, is he being prejudiced? Is he kind of profiling? Is this about city kind of rivalry? You see, we learn later in the Gospel of John that Nathaniel came from a village called Cana. And Cana was, was less than 10 miles from Nazareth. So, so maybe what's happening is, is Nazareth, like their football team, has a winning record against his, you know, city team. And so he's kind of sad about that. And he's like, oh, you know, the University of, of Nazareth is just is always beating us. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. It's that kind of rivalry, right? I don't think it's that, not only because, you know, football wasn't invented till then, but I, I don't think this is what this is about. And, and here's why, because... The idea that Nazareth would be this kind of a, a city of disdain is not well supported in the ancient literature. I mean, we see some of that. It, it wasn't a famous city. It was a pretty small city, but it wasn't famous and it wasn't infamous. What it is, is it's insignificant. It's just small. There's no reason to think of it as being important. And I think that is the point of Nathaniel. Here's why. I, I don't think... He's being prejudiced. I'll give, you, I'll give you two reasons. Okay, we're going to jump down a little bit, and we'll unpack these verses later. But when Jesus finally encounters Nathanael, he says something good about him. If you just jump down to verse 47, it says, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. This is what Jesus is saying of Nathanael. What did Jesus say there? He's commending his character. He's saying, you know what? You're a good guy. 
So it would be really odd if Jesus were to make a statement about his character after he just asked a question that was prejudiced or, or, or profiling or was just kind of mean. I don't think that's what's happening here. I think another clue is Nathan is pretty, or sorry, Nathaniel is pretty well versed in the Old Testament. We see that later when he responds to Jesus and he calls Jesus the Son of God and the King of Israel in verse 49. So he, he knows these Old Testament stories and expectations about Jesus. So we have this man who's, who's, whose character is commended. We have this man who has a pretty good grasp on the Old Testament. Here's what I think he's doing. This question, it's not about a, a prejudice. I think this question is theological. I think what he's saying is, no, Philip, you don't understand. I don't see an Old Testament expectation of the Messiah coming from the city of Nazareth. And he's right. There was no Old Testament expectation that Jesus would come from Nazareth. So it's actually very fair for Nathaniel just to say, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't meet my expectations. Now, here are the questions that you're going to get. When you're sharing your faith, you're going to find yourself in this position. You're going to get a question. You should just assume that you will. And the questions will normally be about expectation. Now, people will say, well, I didn't expect Jesus to want this part of my life, or I didn't expect that part of following Jesus to be something I had to do. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll just run through some of the expectations and, and, and misconstrued expectations I've gotten when I've shared my faith. One of the big ones really is, is a sexual expectation. And here's what I mean by that. I know in sharing my faith and talking about Jesus and kind of telling people what Jesus did on the cross, that he died on the cross for their sin and rose again and he extends to them the gift of forgiveness. And as I'm explaining that, I, I, I've seen people just light up. Ooh, I love that. And then as we talk about what it means to turn from our sin and we start to have a further conversation, we get to the point of how their life should change now that they're following Jesus and surrendering to Jesus as their Lord. And we get to the idea of sex and they'll say something and this is uh, experience that I've had before wait you mean that Jesus doesn't want me living with my girlfriend before I get married and I've gotten this question why does Jesus care about who I have sex with why, why does that have to do anything with following Jesus right, those are hard those are hard questions right but people's expectations could be different. I've gotten this one as well, where people are grappling with the idea of as we start to unpack things in the scriptures and we walk through it and they say, I don't really like how the Bible discourages same-sex relationships. What does that have to do anything with following Jesus? Well, those are really hard questions. Or e even moving away from that, I've gotten questions of, you know, the Bible describes kind of how species came about. And this idea of creation of, of animals. Well, I think evolution explains better the complex nature of the biological life on this planet. So how does that square with the first couple of chapters of Genesis? Those are hard questions. I, I've gotten the question of, well, I don't understand how as we walk through the Old Testament together, I'm seeing this violence in the Old Testament that, that, is, that is authored by God. And yet in the New Testament, I'm seeing Jesus, and he's so incredibly compassionate and asking us to forgive. How can these two kind of ideas work together? Now, these are hard questions. Now, let me just say right up front, these questions have answers. But you're going to get these type of questions. You're going to get maybe even harder questions, more awkward questions, questions that are highly emotionally charged. What do you do? What do you do in that moment when you feel like maybe you know the answer, but you don't know how to give the answer? Right? The worst thing we can do is to not say anything. Is to be paralyzed, to be kept silent. Philip has an incredible strategy for this. But let me reinforce in your mind that Philip is just like us. Because what we're going to see in our passage is Philip does not answer Nathaniel's question. He's stumped. 
he, he, he sees it laid out before him. Wait, this doesn't, these expectations don't match up. I don't know what to do. This is a position that Philip often found himself in in the New Testament. In fact, almost every time that Philip is mentioned, he is the guy, he is the I don't know guy. Let, let me just show you this in the Gospel of John and imagine if this was your history. Imagine if the pages of history were filled with these type of examples. It's, it's kind of embarrassing how Philip is presented in the Gospel of John specifically. He's always the I don't know guy. Right, let me show you in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, this is in verse 5. This is at the, the, the uh, feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus is going to do this miraculous work where he's going to feed 5,000 people. But first, Jesus asks a question to his disciples. Look at this in verse 5. It says, lifting up his eyes, then seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, here's Philip, not mentioned very many times, but every time he is, it seems like he's the I don't know guy. He says to Philip with a question, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Okay, look at Philip's response. 5,000 people gathered. Where are we going to buy food? Verse 6. And he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little bit. I don't know if you have this phrase in your family, but we have it in our family. It's Captain Obvious. Right? It's when you state something that is clearly obvious to everybody. Philip is Captain Obvious. There's a crowd of 5,000 people. And Jesus says, man, how are we going to feed these guys? And Philip's response, now notice, we're in chapter 6. Philip has witnessed Jesus perform the miraculous. He's already seen him heal people. He knows that Jesus is a pretty incredible individual. But all he can say is, man, even if we had a lot of money, a lot of money wouldn't feed all these people. Well, thank you, Captain Obvious. Again, he finds himself in that I don't know position. Look, this happens again to him. Look at chapter 12. Chapter 12. This one's not as embarrassing, but again, an example of Philip not knowing the answer. John chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 22. What happens is some Greeks are at this festival and they want to meet Jesus. They hear about Jesus and they want to meet Jesus. So they go to Philip, so Philip will set set up kind of a a meet and greet, if you will. Verse 22. So they say that we want to see Philip and it says, or sorry, see Jesus. And it said, Philip went and he told Andrew. And Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. What's happening here? Philip doesn't know how to do this on his own. These people come up, they want an appointment with Jesus, and Philip's kind of just standing there. Uh, Andrew? And he just picks another disciple, and then, then Andrew kind of takes over, takes charge, because Philip doesn't know what he's doing. All right, look at this, one more of these, just to show you again that it's okay to not know the answer, because that's often where Philip found himself. This one is probably the most embarrassing for Philip. It's verse 14. Again, further in the ministry of Jesus, Philip should know better probably at this time. This is verse 8. It says, Philip said to him, speaking to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Now just imagine the weight of that statement there. He's saying, Jesus, just show us the cosmic creator of the universe. Show us the infinite, all power, all powerful all-knowing God. That's all I ask. I mean, what more could you ask? He makes it sound like it's a simple task. Like, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth, right? He's saying, all I want for Christmas is divine revelation of the most magnificent being in, in the universe. In fact, the one who is the origin of the universe. That's all I want. You can't ask for a, a bigger thing. And look at Jesus' response. I think Jesus is offended by this question and he points out Philip's ignorance. He points out that he is the I don't know guy. Look at Jesus' reaction. Verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long? 
And you still do not know me, Philip. Man, that one hurts. How long? It's like when you tell your kids, how many times have I told you this? How many times do we have to go through this? That's the posture that Jesus is kind of taking there with Philip. Philip, how long have I been with you, Philip? How many miracles have you seen, Philip? How many teachings must I give, Philip? How clear can I make it, Philip? I mean, we're pretty advanced right now in the scriptures. I mean, it's pretty far into, the, into probably a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years into the ministry of Jesus, and Philip still doesn't get it. He's the I don't know guy. I give you those examples because I want you to feel that it is okay. Be reassured. It's okay if you don't know. It's okay if you don't have the answer. It's fine. I think so many times in Christianity and as followers of Jesus Christ, we put too much on ourselves. We think we must know all the answers. We must eliminate all the questions. But that's not true. And in fact, we're going to see this as John kind of unpacks the relationship of Jesus with many other people. That Jesus is one who welcomes questions. Jesus is the one who welcomes doubt. The scriptures, especially the Gospel of John, make that clear. Just as Nathaniel doubted in the beginning of John's Gospel, the end of John's Gospel is going to have a moment of doubt as well from another disciple by the name of Thomas. He's not going to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He says, I want to see And we kind of give Thomas a bad rap about that, but that's not fair because Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says, come and see. Come and touch. And this is exactly the strategy that Philip uses. Again, our big idea was introductions are better than answers. Look at the strategy. He gives his question. And Nathanael said to him, I'm back in chapter 1, verse 46. 46. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Here's his expectation question. This doesn't fit in my boxes. Jesus doesn't make sense. What about this? And Philip said to him, come and see. I love this. I love this because this is exactly what Jesus said to the disciples that were following him in verse 39. Come and see. That's Jesus' strategy. It's Philip's strategy. It should be our strategy. Just come and see. You know, Nathaniel, I, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Let's, let's, just, let's just have an introduction to Jesus. Let's let just come and see. Just let me get you close to him. Here's what Philip, I think, is thinking. Philip is thinking, I sat with Jesus. We talked, and he explained who he was and his significance, and, and he unpacked for me who he was, and I was convinced. So Philip is thinking, well, that's what worked for me, that I had, had a, I had to have a face-to-face moment with Jesus. And if that worked for me, then it's going to work for my friend. And so he says, Nathaniel, come with me. Now, Nathaniel's going to be a man of questions. We're going to see this again. He's going to do this with Jesus. But Philip's strategy, again, introductions are better than answers. And here's what we're going to find. The reason that is true The reason it's true that introductions are better than answers is because Jesus is so much more impressive than us. Jesus is so much more impressive than us. If we can just get people to Jesus, let him do his work. He will impress. And this is exactly what he does with Nathaniel. Look at Jesus now and Nathaniel. Philip makes the introduction. Here's my friend Nathaniel, and this is what Jesus says as Nathaniel is approaching him. Jesus saw him in verse 47 of chapter 1. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. This sounds really good, right? This is a, a true Israelite. And there is no deceit in him. That feels really good. But the significance of this statement really can't be appreciated 
unless you really see the background of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus has masterfully constructed this compliment. Okay, let's just unpack it. He says first, behold, or sorry, he's, he's speaking of Philip as Philip is, or sorry, as Nathaniel is approaching, coming toward him. He says, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Why does he use the term Israelite? Well, Israelite was kind of just an ethnic term. It's, it's uh, uh, what the Jewish people referred to themselves as. It's kind of to speak of the Jewish people as a whole, they are Israelites. But to speak of them in that way was to point to their patriarch, uh, Israel, who used to be called Jacob. This would kind of think of it like the kind of beginning of their family tree. If they were to do that Ancestry.com, all the Jewish lines would go to Israel, or who was called Jacob. His name was later changed to Israel. So that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is kind of tying it back. He's saying, you are an Israelite. But what's really masterful here is the word that Jesus uses, another word that Jesus uses, uses to describe Nathaniel. And that is, he is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. That's a very interesting word, right? very, very unique compliment to say about somebody. Why does he use that word deceit or lie? Why does he use that? It's because of who he's just referenced. He's just referenced Israel, whose name was Jacob. And you know what Jacob was known as? A man of great deceit. He was a liar. He, he was a, a scoundrel, all right? He was a manipulator. He, he, he was kind of a, a con man. He, he lied to his father to such a great degree, made this whole kind of charade that he stole his brother Esau's birthright, stole his blessing. He does it again to his father-in-law, not only his father, but his father-in-law, right? Happy Father's Day, Jacob, right? To his father-in-law, he lies to him and he makes this whole charade and he steals a great amount of his wealth. This is who Jacob is. And so when Jesus is looking at Nathanael as he's coming, this compliment basically is this. The father of our people, you are better than him. You are an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. You're an Israelite in whom there is no Jacob. You are better than Jacob. Now that is a significant compliment. But how can Jesus make that? I mean, Jesus has never met this man, right? This is the second question that Nathaniel comes up with. Verse 48, he hears this compliment. Maybe uh, he was approaching or rumor got to him. Who knows how he got this compliment? But look at his reaction. Again, Nathaniel being a man of doubt or, or an inquisitive personality, right? He's always looking to ask questions, looking for information. He says this in verse 48. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Right? Maybe, maybe that rivalry is coming out, man. You don't know where I'm from. Oh, you're from Nazareth, right? But I'm from a different place. He's saying, how do you know me? How can you be acquainted with my character? You, we've never met before, and yet you make this statement as if you know me. You are intimately aware of my character. How can you do that? Now watch this. Introductions are better than answers. Why? Because Jesus is so impressive. Look at how Jesus is just going to blow away Nathaniel's expectations. Nathaniel had a question to Philip. Philip didn't know what to do. Well, just come and see. Let me get you to Jesus. Let me make the introduction. Then Nathaniel has a question of Jesus. And watch how Jesus impresses Nathaniel. Look at what he says to him. His response to Nathanael. Jesus answered, I'm in verse 48. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now that doesn't look that profound, right? Maybe Jesus is just saying, you know, I have 20-20 vision, right? Like, I saw you from far away and you were under a fig tree. Now, I think that's a possible reading if we just take that one little passage, that one little sentence. But I don't think that works based on the reaction of skeptical Nathaniel. Look at how his posture towards Jesus changes after he says that. Now, we don't know what Nathaniel was doing under that fig tree. 
Uh, we have a documentation in the ancient world that, that rabbis at times would study the scriptures underneath fig trees, that fig trees were a sign of prosperity. So maybe uh, Nathaniel's a, an affluent kind of scholar and he's reading the scriptures. We don't know. But the, the important part is not about what is Nathaniel doing. It's about how could Jesus see him while he's there. And look at Nathaniel's response. It really unpacks the significance is not what Nathaniel was doing, but the supernatural knowledge of Jesus on display. He not only knows his character as he's coming, but he saw him before he ever came. And Nathaniel responds in this way, verse 49. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now that is an interesting response. If Jesus is just showing off his 2020 vision, if he's just is showing off uh, the power, uh, you know, his optical power, then that does not make sense. Right? Nathaniel should have said something like, wow, you must have really good vision. Did you get LASIK? What did you get? Well, how, how did that happen? No, I think what Nathaniel is showing is that there's no way Jesus should have known where he was at. I think he gives that kind of marker because it's significant to Nathaniel saying, He was so far away. There's no way Jesus could have seen him from afar. Maybe there were several hills in front of where Jesus was and where Nathanael was when Philip met him. Philip journeyed back to find his friend Nathanael, maybe in his hometown. And then he brings him to where Jesus is at. And Jesus makes this statement and he says, wait a second, that doesn't work. It'd be like Jesus calling out your specific address knowing you lived four or five states away, but he picked out, yeah, I know where you came from. You came from this address. Nathaniel is so incredibly impressed, this skeptic now becomes so excited, he gives these grand titles to Jesus. He calls him the Son of God and the King of Israel. Now, what does that mean? We've got to unpack those. We don't, I don't think we want to read too much into those, but they are very significant statements. Like, for instance, when you hear the term son of God, as a 21st century Bible reader, of course, we have all of the scriptures unpacked for us, and the significance of that term, son of God, is incredibly significant. We know it speaks to the nature of who Jesus is, that Jesus is is equal to God because he is, in essence, God. He is part of the divine trinity, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he is God. And that statement, Son of God, has that meaning packed into it. But I don't think that's completely what Nathaniel is saying here. I think Nathaniel is speaking better than he knows. Again, this is the initial encounter. It's a significant statement, but I don't think he's ready to say, you are equal to God. I think what he's saying, though, is you are like God. And the reason I think that is because I think this kind of way of speaking, Son of God... That kind of way of speaking was very common in the Hebrew world. And I think now we have the kind of the Hebrew language kind of making an impression on the Greek here is that the Hebrew language didn't have a lot of adjectives at their disposal. So I think of like large house. And so they didn't have a lot of adjectives like large to describe nouns. And so oftentimes they would use different um, idiomatic phrases. And, and what they would do it would be like son of this. And so if somebody were, say, to be uh, uh, executed, they would call him a son of death. Uh, Judas is called a son of perdition. Uh, if you are a man of honor, you would be called a son of valor. So it was a way to describe somebody. Jesus does the same thing. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. So you see, Jesus used it there. Jesus is not saying, if you make peace, then you are equal to God. He's not saying that. He's saying you're acting like God. You're acting like your father. This is what I think Nathaniel is doing. He's saying to Jesus, you are close to God. You are like God. First, he was a little creeped out that this guy can make this statement about his character. And now he's saying, no, 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 no. You are like God. And then he takes the next level and says, you are the king of Israel. Now, this is directly related to the Old Testament understanding of who the Messiah would be, who the hero would be. David was given a promise, the great king in the Old Testament, that he would have a son who would sit on his throne forever. He would have a kingdom that would be forever. What is he talking about here? 
He's saying, you're that king that we've been waiting for. You're, Philip said that you were the, one, the, the new Moses. Now you're the new David. You're the new king. You're the new leader and prophet and liberator, but you're also the new king to bring in the kingdom of God. He's making a significant statement. And he doesn't just say, you're the king we've been waiting for. He says, you're the king of Israel. We can't lose the idea Nathaniel has just been called an Israelite by Jesus. And then Nathaniel says, you are the king of Israel. What is he saying there? He's saying, you're my king. I am Israelite. And you are my king. Does Jesus impress? Oh, he does. But Jesus takes it even further than that. Why are introductions better than answers? Is because Jesus is just so impressive. He impresses Nathaniel. And then he makes this promise. You think that was impressive? That I said I saw you from far away? Oh, just wait. What you are about to see will blow away your expectations. Look at this. Jesus just continues to impress. Look at verse 50. It says, Jesus answered him, Because I said I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Well, Nathaniel would say, yes, I do. I love this about Jesus. He doesn't just stop there. Look what he says. You will see greater things than this. And then he gives this illustration, which can be lost on us a little bit, but I'm going to fill it out here for you because you have to see a little bit of background. Look at what he says here. It's verse 51. And he said to him, truly, truly. Now, when Jesus says this, he means pay attention. Truly, truly, or can be translated, amen, amen. Basically, it's like when your coach used to take your football helmet and look at you because you missed your block. And he says, do that again. You're sitting on the bench. That kind of attention-grabbing moment, that's what Jesus is doing. So anytime you see that truly, truly, or amen, amen, or verily, verily, Jesus is kind of grabbing our face mask, right, getting into our grill right there and saying, don't miss this next statement. Look at what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, why is this a significant statement? Again, Jesus is incredibly masterful in how he uses pictures in language. I mean, he really is. What is Jesus talking about here? Now, remember, when, when Jesus said to Nathaniel, you're an Israelite, Indeed, in whom there is no deceit. He's, refer he's referring to Jacob. He's saying, you're not like Jacob. You're better than Jacob. What Jesus is doing here is he's saying, okay, Nathaniel, you're better than Jacob, but I am better than anything that Jacob ever experienced spiritually. Okay, here's how I, I believe that's true in our passage here. See, Jacob had this remarkable encounter with God, probably his most remarkable encounter with God. He had just lied to his father, cheated his brother, right? One of deceit. He's running away from Esau. And as he's running away from Esau, he gets tired. And so he sleeps and he dreams and he has this vision. Here's the vision. He sees angels ascending and descending on a ladder. And then he sees at the top of that ladder... God speaking a promise, telling Jacob, I'm going to give you a blessing, Jacob. I'm going to give you a land. Through you, the promise I spoke to Abraham to bless the world. I'm giving that to you. And the land that you're fleeing from right now because of fear of your brother, I'm going to bring you back to that. Jacob wakes up, and this is what he says. This is an awesome place. I didn't know that God was here. And so he names the place Bethel, which means house of God. Jesus is saying, okay, Nathaniel, you're better than Jacob, but I'm better than Bethel. I'm better than Jacob's ladder, as often we refer to, the angels ascending and descending. I'm better than that experience. That was a sacred place in which God chose to reveal his truth. I'm a sacred person. I embody the truth of God because I am God. The revelation I give is pure, is clear, is superior to anything you've ever experienced. You are better than Jacob, but I am better than Bethel. You're impressed, but you're going to get even more impressed. And I think you will too. 
As you journey through the Gospel of John, I think you'll see that same thing. So what do I want you to take away from this? Again, I know, I know, I, I still have them. I still have conversations and times where I feel trapped like I don't know the answer. I don't know the best way to respond. And I'm sure you've experienced at times where you get that moment where you finally take the courage to take the next step to have a conversation about Jesus. And you finally do it and it does not go the way you want it to. And you just get frustrated and you, 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 just, you can't get an answer out and you just stumble over your words. And then about six minutes after the conversation is over and the person is left, you have all the answers that flood your mind. You're like, man, I should have said that. I should have said that. And I should have said that. And you feel like calling them back up and just saying, hey, I, I messed it all up last time. Can we go at this again? And I think at times we take our lack of information of feeling like I'm the I don't know guy. Right? We're all ambitious to wanting to share our faith. I think even now more than ever. Just watching the world just being torn apart. A, a, a torn apart by a virus, a sickness, but then now torn apart by sin. Of seeing just a, a grand parade of a lack of love for one another. Right? It's honestly, let's be honest, as, as just, just, just in human lenses, it's disappointing where we are. It is. I don't think anybody is excited about where we are. There's potential for us to get better. That's true. But first we have to see that where we are is not great. And we believe as followers of Jesus Christ, the only way to make that next step for us to be better in the world, to get better, is to get more Jesus. It is to see that Jesus is the one who can handle our sin, who can transform us inside. And so we need to start conversations about Jesus. And I know you want to do that. And you want, you're eager to do it even though you're shelter in place. You're bursting inside wanting to tell somebody about Jesus so you can see their life change. So you can see this world change. But you get that moment of fear. I'm just not trained enough. I just don't know the answers enough. I, I just can't do it. It's okay to feel like that. It really is. Philip felt like that a lot as we saw in the Gospel of John. But he had a perfect strategy. Introductions are better than answers. Just get them to Jesus. Just introduce them to Jesus. I know we want to have the answers. I know we want to put that all together. But let's just get them to Jesus. When I was, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about a phrase um, our audio technician uh, in our ministry here at Valley Bible Church says all the time, I think it's hilarious, and his name is Chris. He's a really funny guy. And so we've, we've had some of these different difficulties in trying to put together our online services. And his team has done a fabulous job of putting that together. I mean, really, really great job. You should applaud them. You should like them on Facebook or whatever, you know, become their friend. And, and Chris has this, this saying, he says, and I think it's hilarious. So we'll have like, something will happen and we're like, oh, we'll be all bummed out. Like, oh, another, another hurdle. You know, this didn't work. This mic didn't work. This camera angle didn't work. The upload didn't work. Every, you know, whatever it is. And this is what Chris says. It's another opportunity. It's not a hurdle. It's just another opportunity. I think that's exactly Philip's mentality. Man, that's a good question. That's not a hurdle. That's an opportunity. Come and see, man. Come and see. I think it's remarkable at times how we try to be so impressive with our knowledge, get everything out there as much as we can, and yet we have this fascinating book right here that's changed our lives, that has the Word of God in it, the words of Christ in it. I think sometimes what we try to do is we try to give people our answers and then convince them enough to get them to read the Bible. Don't you think that's kind of backwards? What would Philip do? Well, Philip would just go, hey man, I, I met this guy. His name is Jesus. He's incredible. He's the answer to all our problems. Is he really the answer? Well, come and see. Make an introduction. I told you last week to think of one person, one person that you could just, that God would press upon your heart that you could share your faith with. And I hope you had that one person in mind. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna push you a little bit. I'm gonna challenge you a little bit to do something. Okay, and I think, I think many of you can take this challenge on. I really do. 
I don't think it's, it's very hard or away from many of us. And it's this. That one person that, that God impressed upon your heart, that you would start a conversation with Jesus so you can see their life change. Here's what I invite you to do. Just ask them this question. Hey, would you read the Gospels with me? Let's just read the Gospels together, and, and I'd love to discuss it with you. They, they mean a lot to me. It, it's less than 100 pages. or about 100 pages in the average Bible. So it's, 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 it's smaller than a normal book that you would read. Uh, the, uh, smaller than the New York Times bestseller. Uh, maybe you have a book club. Or you have a book club that uh, you get to recommend books. Why not do this? Why not say, hey, guys, on this round, I got a smaller book, which many of that, that room might applaud. Hey, it's only about 100 pages or so. I, I think we should read the Gospels. And maybe you could sell it like this. Well, you know, even just from a historical perspective, the Gospels are the most printed and read piece of literature in human history. That no other piece of literature in human history has ever had more of an impact than the Gospels. Whether you believe their content or not, you cannot deny the historical significance of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think everybody should read the Gospels at least once in their life even if they never believe its content, just for the historical significance of what it is. Nothing has been reprinted more than the Gospels. Nothing is sold more times than the Gospels. So just say, hey, would you guys be willing to do that? You're opening an opportunity, what? For them to be introduced to Jesus. You don't need to know, have, have, need to know all the answers. Just introduce them to Jesus. Ask them, will you read the Gospels with me. I think you'd be surprised at how open people are to read the Bible with you and imagine how that could change their life. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we, we thank you for who you are to us in Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, how we yearn for a great amount of impact in our nation right now. Father, we are so incredibly burdened and disappointed with our own behavior. Father, we don't seem to learn the lesson that people that look different than us are not less than us. Father, we, we have not seemed to realize that every human being is made in the image of God and therefore has incredible value and should be treated as such. And Father, we all yearn for everyone to have that kind of vision of each other. But Father, we know that vision will not be granted until we see Jesus Christ correctly. Because he's the only one who can solve this sin problem. And Father, I pray that you would Give us courage and boldness. Even though we're shelter in place and we can't be around people, we can still have impact. And the moment to have impact seems to have never been greater than now. The moment for it is now. And the question is, who will step in to this moment? Father, I pray it is those listening to this that will step into that moment. To see that telling somebody about Jesus is the only thing that's going to give them true hope. I pray that the legislation, the reform that comes out of this moment is good. But I know it is not going to solve the problem long term. Because the problem is heart deep. So I pray, Father, that you would give us courage to speak hope in this moment. To not be afraid if we don't know the answer. Father, I pray that you give courage to the people listening to this message. That they would call a friend up, text them, message them on Facebook or on Instagram. And say, hey, would you be willing to read the Gospels with me? This book has changed my life and I would be curious to see your opinion about it. Father, I think many people would be open to that. Maybe not eager, but at least open. Well, let's just start there. Father, please, for those that are listening, Father, grant us many Phillips who just say, come and see. 
Come and see who Jesus is. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our online services. We look forward to seeing you next week.